Greetings, we are Easy Allies. I'm Michael Huber, and that is Brandon Jones. Woo! Here we are. Yeah, four minutes, baby. Four minutes to go. Cutting, people thought we cut a little close. I'm cutting it close because what the heck do we talk about? Terraflops. <laughs> we got we got Michael Huber here and Brandon yep. Jones, the two tech wizards. Oh yeah. At Easy Allies, man. Oh yeah. I know we're all here about to, tech. I'm here to talk about solid state drives. I'm here to talk about flops. You're baby. talking about USB ports. But we need to, uh, I think you can <laughs> see people saying in a chat, and we got we got two chats up here right now. We're going to go yeah. full screen uh, when uh, when this starts in four minutes. Um, and th are there going to be any game announcements, Michael Huber? I don't think so. I don't think so, but I'm still holding out a sliver of hope, Jones, because, like, what better way to show off right. your tech than with a game running? Oh, true. Like but it's, it's all gonna be, it's gonna be Spider Man. It's gonna yeah. be God of War. It's Old gonna be you know like yeah yeah because yeah, we yeah. just had a, a, a blowout totally. on the Xbox with yeah. the Series X and it's you know Small hope, Halo Five. Minecraft was the first one of the first things Austin showed. You're like okay, <laughs> it's like look at the drastic difference. You know when yeah. you, you add all these new graphic effects. Mac like, Three yeah, yeah. is not even a meme. If there were one game, it would be well, Mac Three. You got Cerny there. He <laughs> yeah. set a precedent. It's been long yeah. enough. <laughs> I, Sadly, all roads do. The road to PS5 yeah. does point to NAC 3. Totally. <laughs> We're going to be stopping by the way station. Um, yeah, Jones. Yeah, man. Uh, oh, not those teraflops. Xbox says 12. I know that's like the big number that's going down, but it's not the most important thing. But right. like, everyone is going to be focused on. I mean, flops and I mean, not not, not state drives. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be focused on production value. Yeah. Because uh, Xbox has had Digital Foundry, Austin. They've had a lot of other people showing off the system for them uh, to, and it, 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 there definitely is bonuses of that. They definitely like even in Austin's video, like he goofs a couple times, yeah. you know, like, uh, and so I, I think they they want to show kind of that. Uh, that personability, that like the comfort there. They're like, oh, we we're, we're, we'll show this to anybody. We yeah. want you to come in and check out this thing that we're working on. Um, and so, but this is certainty. And this is like, no, 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 no. I'm coming out. Uh, so I'm curious where we're going to be. Are they going to be like, you know, on a stage? Is he going to be in front of a blue, you know, green screen? Yeah. Is it going to be? I hope he's next to a fireplace. Is it going to be? <laughs> yeah. But is he going to be behind closed doors? Is he going to be moving a lot? <laughs> is it going to be like documentary style where he's going to be going to the different departments in people's offices talking about the stuff that they're working on? Great question. Or is it literally, it's just, I think it's just going to be voice server? And I know that so. people are just rolling their eyes like, is this seriously what we're talking about? But it's like, that. that is my, that is my. Yeah. That, that is actually what I do know. Yeah. Is uh, potentially how to package material like this, and we are one minute away. Potentially just a lot of numbers being thrown at us. Right, 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 right. A lot of tech jargon chat. Settle in. And it is live, so wait, we're going to have to wind back a little bit before we kick it up. And uh, did, you know, did audio tests on how loud I thought it should be beforehand, but obviously let us know. And you let me know. I want, I want that to be perfect for you and the headphones here. Oh, heard. hell yeah. I want that to be balanced. But, Balanced. Uh, yeah, we're about a minute away, so cool. Cozy up to chat. I hope they. I hope they show a game. That'd be really sweet. Oh, of course, at least one. Release the demos. But we're gonna see. We're gonna see. Yeah, show me the good. Uh, show me the features, chat. Show me the new features of the PlayStation Five. Suspend Here we'll shortly. Suspend ten game at once. Insta load them up. I want to see what kind of features. You know what I would really love though? I said this to Jones a minute ago. You know what I would love? Number one thing I want, even more, like, if they don't show games, is the UI. Show me PS5 user interface. Let me see that. Pretty, pretty please. Show me the UI. You don't even need to move around in the UI. Just show me that, like, starting screen, you know? Oh yeah, get your Sony fleece on. I left mine at my buddy's house, yeah. and I can't, I can't hang out with them, man. Aww. The quarantine, <laughs> yeah. man. You can't get I that. I can't go to his house. Dang He's it. Got tons of roommates, man. He's <sighs> sitting on his couch. I gotta, I gotta go in there, and grab it with tongs. Yeah. Put it in a bag. Yeah. Wash it when I get home. Yeah, you need to wash that oh, thing that twice. Cup, that, that, that North Face is so cozy, man. It is like my go-to warm. Did they you get two of they them? sent yeah yeah I think we got two we got two and I, you and I stacked them man yes fleece bros <laughs> yes because I never had a jacket like this ever right. in my life and it's so warm and cozy I get cold chat you know I bring blankets everywhere 
I'm always freezing. Oh, here we go. Minute 50. He has five, Jones. We, we're here. Good news today, chat. Isn't that nice, you know? Well, hopefully good news. <laughs> you got your snuggie. Oh, yeah. Ready to roll. A little loud? Yeah, you got you got a good 87 seconds, Jones. No rush. I'm guessing by the time it's over, we're really just going to be... I do want it to be a little bit on loud side because we do want to listen to the sound. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll shout. Sound. If you want to be over. This thing might be louder than the video says below. So we'll see. You know, I had, a, I had a question about just like storage and stuff. Everyone is like, oh, it's got to have a terabyte. You know, oh, terabyte. And it's like, but as games get more advanced shows, don't the file sizes get bigger? You know, does it like... 100 gigs now seem like nothing. Yeah. You know, a terabyte I mean, that seems like nothing. But I mean, I think that's kind of the point. That's like the, the, you know, if we're there at launch or if we get there throughout the next gen, I think that's the point for like those numbers to kind of become trivial because so much of that stuff is happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Where it's just like, you're not worrying about how big your download file is because it happened last night. It happened while you were sleeping or it happens behind the scenes when you're playing a different game. Yeah. You know. So that kind of stuff, yeah, we don't have to you know, squabble that. Thanks for coming in, dude. Absolutely. Now I gotta wash my hands. Yeah. Wash them. Thanks no, for tuning in, that. everybody. Thank you for the subs and resubs. Everybody resubbing right now. Need to turn your mic up, they say. We'll see. We will see. Hi. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel the, the, the fake people at front. Uh, plan for GDC. Um, but we do cool? have some super exciting oh, news about PS5, uh, and what did, who better to bring that to you than the one and only Mark? They started with unfortunately. You, Mark. Thank you, Jim. There will be lots of chances later on this year to look at the PlayStation 5 games. Today, I want to gotcha. talk a bit about our goals for the PlayStation 5 hardware and how they influenced the development of the console. The goals. I think you all know, I'm a big yeah, believer in console generations. That's Once every five or six or seven years, a console arrives with substantially- They're saying the video's too quiet, I think. There's a lot of learning by the game developers, hopefully not too overwhelming, and soon there's games that could never have been created before. Now, it used to be that as a console designer, you'd somehow intuit what would be the best set of capabilities for the new console, and then build it in complete secrecy. For the PlayStation consoles, that period lasted through PlayStation 3, a powerful and groundbreaking console, but also one that caused quite a lot of heartache as it was initially difficult to develop games. For. 599 US dollars. So, starting with PlayStation 4, we've taken a different approach, roughly centered around three principles. The first of these is listening to the developers, which is to say that a lot of what we Good put advice. into a console derives directly from the needs and aspirations of the game creators. We definitely do have some ideas of our own, but at the core of our philosophy for designing consoles is that game players are here for the fantastic games. Which is to say that game creators matter. Anything we can do to make life easier for the game creators or help them realize their dreams, we will do. So about once every two years, I take a tour of the industry. I go to the various developers and publishers, sit down, and discuss how they're doing with the current consoles and what they'd like to see in future consoles. That's a lot of this developers, bro. Yes. The road is reaching the bulk of the game creators involved. None in Alaska. Well over yeah, look at the East Coast, man. We got seven of our game. And, developers. and it is Seriously. incredibly valuable. By the way, the feature most requested by the developers, that was an SSD, which we were very happy to put in the hardware, but a lot of problem solving was required. I'll be doing a deep dive on the SSD and surrounding systems later on in this talk. Cool. It's also key to make a generational leap while keeping the console sufficiently familiar to game developers. I think about this in terms of balancing evolution and revolution. Now, with PlayStation 1, 2, and 3, the target was a revolution each time with a brand new feature set. That was great in many ways, but time for the developers to get up and running got longer with each console. In the past, I've called this time to triangle. 
Here's what I had for those three consoles. To be clear, I'm not talking about time to make a game. Developers will be ambitious, and it may take them six years or so to realize their vision. What I'm talking about is that dead time before graphics and other aspects of game development are up and running, and trying to minimize that. On the other hand, if we're trying to reduce that dead time to zero, that means the hardware architecture can't change at all. We're handcuffed. We need to judge for each feature what value it adds and whether it's worth the increase in developer time needed to support it. So with PlayStation we 4, we were able to strike ah. a pretty good balance between performance and familiarity. We got required learning back to PlayStation 1 levels. With PS5, the GPU was definitely the area we felt the most tension between adding new features and keeping a familiar programming model. Ultimately, I think we've ended up with something under <laughs> a month of Got us. To speed. That feels like we're striking. The console's only the logo. I'll go yeah. into a bit more detail yeah. later today about our philosophy with the GPU. And this <laughs> it's shaped like a PS, you know. Result. Whoa. It's also very important <laughs> for us as the hardware dreams. team. To dreams. Dreams confirmed. New dreams. dreams. By which I mean something other than CPU performance, GPU performance, and the amount of RAM. The increase in graphics performance over the past two decades has been astonishing, but there are other areas in which we can innovate and provide significant value to the game creators, and through them, the players. That's why the SSD was very much on our list of directions to explore, regardless of what came out of the conversations with game developers and publishers. Yeah, it's like required The biggest SSD. feature in this category is Honestly. the custom engine for audio. That's today's final topic. The push for vastly improved audio, and in particular 3D audio, isn't something that came out of the developer meetings. It's much more the case that we had a dream of what might be possible five years from now, and then worked out a number of steps we could take to set us on that path. So here again are the three principles, the first being enabling the desires of developers to drive the hardware design. To me, the SSD really is the key to the next generation. It's a, a game changer. And it was the number one ask from developers for PlayStation 5. As in, we know it's probably impossible, but can you put an SSD in it? That was a discussion we were also having internally. It was clear that the presence of a hard drive in every PlayStation 4 was having a positive impact. A lot of things that would simply have been impossible at Blu-ray disc speeds were now yeah, possible. You're, look, you're looking chunky there, Cerny. Come the on. Same time, Catch though, up. In 2015 and 2016, when we were having these conversations, Not a lot going on in this video. Come on. already <laughs> banging up against the limits of the hard drive. And a lot of developer time was being spent designing around slow load speeds. I want to focus in on just one number here, which is how long it takes to load a gigabyte of data from a hard drive. The difficulty being that hard drives are neither particularly fast nor flexible. If all your data is in one block, which is frankly not very likely, you can load 50 to 100 megabytes a second, depending on where the data is located on the hard drive. Let's assume it's on the outer edge, which means loading a gigabyte takes 10 seconds. If you compress your game packages, you can fit more data on the Blu-ray disc and also effectively boost your hard drive read speed by the compression ratio. We support Zlib decompression on PlayStation 4. Zlib, baby! Something like 50% more data on the disc and 50% higher effective read speed. Unfortunately, though, it's highly likely that your data is scattered around in various files on the hard drive. Man, I always got seeds As well that. as sourced from multiple locations within those files. So lots of seeks are needed at 2 to 50-ish milliseconds each. My rule of thumb is that the hard drive is spending two-thirds of its time seeking, and only a third of its time actually loading data. Putting all of that together, a gigabyte is very roughly 20 seconds to load from a hard drive. Now, a gigabyte is not much data. Games are using five or six gigabytes of RAM on PlayStation 4, so boot times and load times can get pretty grim. Or to put that differently... Grim. Thing. All right, you dude, Destiny 2, grim. grim. Wait yeah. for the game yeah. to load. Destiny 2 is legit the level grim. To reload every time you die, and you wait for what is euphemistic. <laughs> the, the, first, <laughs> the first PS5 exclusive, All grim load. <laughs> What if we could have not just an SSD, but a blindingly fast SSD? If we could load five gigabytes a second from it, what would change? Now, SSDs are completely different from hard drives. They don't have seeks as such. If you have wow. a five gigabyte a second SSD, you can read data from a thousand different locations in that second, go. pretty much at speed. 
As for time to load a gigabyte, this is next gen we're talking about, so memory is bigger. Instead, we should be asking how long to load two gigabytes. And the answer is about a quarter of a second. And that's amazing. We're talking two orders of magnitude, meaning very roughly 100 times faster. Which means at five gigabytes a second for the SSD, oh, the potential is that the, the loading was like in a second. twenty seconds. There are no loads for PS4 for and just point fades two down seconds for PS5. Five gigabytes and fades back up. <laughs> Same for a reload. You're immediately back in the action after you die, and fast travel becomes so fast it's blink and you miss. That it. is going to be As so game nice. creators, we go from trying to distract <laughs> the player from how long fast travel is taking, like those Spider-Man subway rides, to being <laughs> so blindingly fast that we might even have to slow that transition down. Pretty cool, right? But for me, this is not <laughs> the primary reason to change from a hard drive to an SSD. The Best primary compliment I can give Cerny? Kind of a Mr. SSD Rogers vibe right now. Oh, certainly, yes. Yeah. soothing calmness. Well, to put that differently, with a hard drive, Love it. the 20 seconds that it takes to load a gigabyte can sabotage the game that the developer is trying to create. I think almost all of us in the room have experienced this, maybe in different ways. Say we're making an adventure Spencer Mansion? Oh, we have two rich environments where we each want enough textures and models to fill memory. Which you can do as long as you have a long staircase or elevator Is ride it? or a windy corridor where you can ditch the old assets and then take 30 seconds or so to load the new assets. Having a 30-second elevator ride is a, a little extreme. More realistically, we'd probably chop the world into a number of smaller pieces and then do some calculations with sight lines and run speeds like we did for Haven City when we were making Jack 2. The game nice. is 20 Callback. years old, yeah. not much has changed since awesome. then. All those twisty passages are there for a reason. There's a whole subset of level design dedicated to this sort of work, but still, it's a giant distraction for a team that Check just four. wants to make their game. Wish. So when I talked about the dream of an SSD, part of the reason for that 5 gigabyte a second target was to eliminate loads, but also part of the reason for that target was streaming. As in, what if the SSD is so fast that as the player is turning around, it's possible to load textures for everything behind the player in that split second. If you figure that Challenge it accepted. takes half yeah. a second to turn, that's four gigabytes of compressed data. In the cloud. That sounds about right. Mac right. three, just spinning in circles. Back to the hard drive. Another strategy for increasing effective read speed is to make big sequential chunks of data. For example, we might group all the data together for each city block. That removes most of the seeks, and the streaming gets faster. But there's a downside too which is that frequently used data is included in many chunks and therefore is on the hard drive many, many times. Marvel Spider-Man uses this strategy, and though it works very well for increasing the streaming speed, there's a massive duplication as a result. Some of the objects like mailboxes or news racks are on the hard drive 400 times. What I'm describing here are things that cramp a creative director's style. Either level design gets a little bit boring in places, or the data is duplicated so many times that it no longer fits on the Blu-ray disc. There is a test and after you end this, up hobo, yeah. hard limits on the player's run speed or driving speed. The player can't go faster than the load speed from the hard Professor Cerny right now. It's awesome. And finally, I'm sure many of you have noticed <laughs> that after a patch download, the PlayStation 4 will sometimes take a long time. To Copying, install. yes! Nightmare! That's because when just part of a file has Nightmare. been changed, the new data can be downloaded Grim. very quickly. <laughs> But before the game boots up, a brand new file has to be constructed that includes the changed portion. Otherwise, every change would add a seek or two. Even so, you can occasionally see this happening on game titles. They start to hitch once they get patched enough. With an SSD, though, no seeks. So no need to make brand new files with the changes incorporated into them. Which means it's very no nice. Oh, cool. as you know them today. There's yet one more benefit, which is that system memory can be used much more efficiently. On PlayStation 4, game data on the hard drive feels very distant and difficult to use. By the time you realize you need a piece of data, it's much too late to go out and load it. So system memory has to contain all of the data that could be used in the next 30 seconds or so of gameplay. That means a lot of the eight gigabytes of system memory is idle. It's just waiting there to be potentially used. On PlayStation 5, though, the SSD is very close to being like more RAM. 
Typically, it's fast enough that when you realize you need a piece of data, you can just load it from the SSD and use it. There's no need to have lots of data parked in system memory waiting to potentially be used. A different way of saying this gigs. is that most of RAM is working on the game's behalf. This is one of the reasons that 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 feels right for PlayStation 5. The presence of the SSD reduces the need for a massive intergenerational increase in size. So back to the dream of the SSD. Here's the set of targets. Boot the game in a second. No load screens. Design freedom, meaning no twisty passages or long corridors. More game on the disk and more game on the SSD. And finally, those patch installs go away. The reality, though, is that the SSD is just one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of places where bottlenecks can occur in between the SSD and the game code that uses the data. You can see this on PlayStation 4. If I use an SSD with 10 times the speed of a standard hard drive, I probably see only double the loading speed, if that. For PlayStation 5, our goal was not just that the SSD itself be 100 times faster, it was that game loads and streaming would be 100 times faster. So every single potential bottleneck needed to be addressed. 100 times! And there are a lot of them. 100 times! Check, and what happens when its overhead gets 100 times faster? job! Better. Conceptually, check-in is a pretty simple process. Data is loaded into system memory from the hard drive or SSD. It's examined. A few values are tweaked to check it in. And then it's moved to its final location. At the SSD speeds we're talking about, that last part, moving the data, meaning copying it from one location to another, takes roughly an entire next-gen CPU core. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If all the overheads get 100 times larger, that will cripple the frame rate as soon as the player moves, and that massive stream of data starts coming off the SSD. So to solve all of that, we built a lot of custom hardware, namely a custom flash controller and a number of custom units in our main chip. The flash controller in the SSD was designed for smooth and bottleneck-free operation, but also with games in mind. For example, there are six levels of priority when reading from the SSD. Priority is very important. You can imagine the player heading into some new location in the world and the game requesting a, a few gigabytes of textures. And while those textures are being loaded, an enemy is shot and has to speak a few dying words. <laughs> Having multiple priority levels lets the audio for those dying words get loaded. Dying words. I like how he said, like, he's spoken of death I'm multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> connects to the actual flash dies. That it's really high. Story. It's just funny with, the, <laughs> with, the, with this point. <laughs> so, you're, you're killing someone, second, okay? You're looking, you're going for the jugular. You're watching them bleed out on the floor. Uh, you want that blood to look good. So, how we imagine it. Gigabytes a second. With a 12 channel interface, the most natural size that emerges for an SSD grim, is grim. 825 gigabytes. The key question for us was is that enough? I mean, it's tempting to add more, but Flash certainly doesn't come cheap, and we have a responsibility to our gaming audience to be cost effective with regards to what we put in the console. Ultimately, we resolved this question by looking at the play patterns of a broad range of gamers. We examined the specific games that they were playing over the course of a weekend or a week or a month, and uh, whether that set of games would fit properly on the SSD. We were able to establish that the friction caused by reinstalled or redownloads <clears throat> would be quite <clears throat> Were any of those games NAC 2? Tell us! <laughs> while also preparing multiple strategies so that those who want more storage can add it. I'll go through the details. Memory cards. Yeah. Back to Externals. the flash controller. Mm. On the other side, it connects to our For main sure. custom chip via four it's lanes coming. of Gen 4 PCIe. And inside the main custom chip is a pretty hefty unit dedicated to I.O. Before we talk about what that does, let's talk compression for a moment. PlayStation 4 used Zlib as its compression format. We decided to use it again on PlayStation 5, but on my 2017 tour of developers, I learned about a new format called Kraken from Rad Game Tools. <laughs> really? He's like the Kraken! Yeah. smarter cousin. Simple, uh, similar types of algorithms, but about 10% better compression, which is pretty big. That means 10% more game on the UHD Blu-ray disc or on the SSD. Kraken had only been out for a year, but it was already becoming a de facto industry standard. Half of the teams I talked to were either using it or getting ready to evaluate it. 
So we hustled and built a custom decompressor into the I.O. unit, one capable of handling over 5 gigabytes of Kraken format input data a second. After decompression, that typically becomes 8 or 9 gigabytes, but the unit itself is capable of outputting as much as 22 gigabytes a second if the data happened to compress particularly well. By the way, in terms of performance, that custom decompressor equates to nine of our Zen 2 cores. That's what it would take to decompress the crack and stream with a conventional CPU. There's a lot more in the custom I.O. unit, including a dedicated DMA controller. The game can direct exactly where it wants to send the data coming off of the SSD. This equates to another Zen 2 core or two in terms of its copy performance. Its primary purpose is to remove check-in as a bottleneck. There's two dedicated I.O. coprocessors and a large RAM pool. These aren't Zen 2 cores. They are there principally to direct the variety of custom hardware around them. One of the coprocessors is dedicated to SSD I.O. This lets us bypass traditional Stuff's over my head, Jones, right now. Yeah. When we <laughs> the, SSD. the other is responsible for memory mapping, which I know doesn't sound like anything related to the SSD, but a lot of developers map. I do know those two holes are going to be filled and I'm on the edge of my seat. And this too can become... <laughs> The bottleneck. There are coherency <laughs> engines. Coherency, coherency and, and, and your yeah. coherency engines. Coherency comes up a lot in places. Probably Can't the read. biggest coherency issue is stale data in the GPU caches. Flushing all of the GPU caches whenever the SSD is read is an unattractive option. It could really hurt the GPU performance. So we've implemented a gentler way of doing things where the coherency engines inform the GPU of the overwritten address ranges and custom scrubbers in several dozen GPU caches do pinpoint evictions of just those address ranges. The best thing is, as a game developer, when you read from the SSD, you don't need to know any of this. You don't even need to know that your data is compressed. You just indicate what data you'd like to read from your original uncompressed file and where you'd like to put it and the whole process of loading it in, happens invisibly to you and at very high speed. Back to the dream. Thanks to all of that surrounding hardware, our 5.5 gigabytes a second really should translate into something like 100 times faster I.O. than PS4 and allow the dream of no load screens and super fast streaming to become a reality. Having said that, expandability of our SSD is going to be quite important. Flash is costly, and you may very well want to add storage to whatever we put in the console. Now, the kind of storage you need depends on how you're going to use it. If you have an extensive PlayStation 4 library and you'd like to take advantage of backwards compatibility to play those games on PlayStation mm -hmm. 5, then a large external hard drive is ideal. You can leave your games on the hard drive and play them directly from there, thus saving the pricier SSD storage for your PlayStation 5 titles, or you can copy your active PlayStation 4 titles to the SSD. If your purpose in adding more storage is to play PlayStation 5 titles, though, ideally you would add to your SSD storage. We will be supporting certain M2 SSDs. These are internal drives that you can get on the open market and install in a bay in the PlayStation 5. Okay. As for which ones we support and when, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. They connect through the custom I.O. unit, just like our SSD does. So they can take full advantage of the decompression, I.O. coprocessors, and all the other features I was talking about. Wow. Here's the catch, though. That commercial drive has to be at least as fast as ours. Games that rely on the speed of our SSD need to work flawlessly with any M2 drive. Wow. When I gave the Wired interview last year, I said that the PlayStation 5 SSD was faster than anything available on PC. Dude. At the time, so... commercial M2 drives used PCIe 3.0, and four yeah. lanes of that cap out at 3.5 gigabytes a second. In other words, no So you can PCIe just use a lot of your SSDs that you have now, Jones. That's awesome. M2 drives with PCIe 4.0 are now out in the market. We're getting our in uh, samples and seeing four or five gigabytes a second from them. <laughs> By year's end, I expect there will be drives that saturate 4.0 and support seven gigabytes a second. Having said that, Too we slow, are comparing it. apples and oranges, though, because Not that me. commercial M2 drive will have its own architecture, its own Got flash it. controller, and so on. For Good example, the NVMe specification lays out a priority scheme for requests that the M2 drives can use. And that scheme is pretty nice, but it only has two true priority levels. Our drives support six. We can 
hook up a drive with only two priority levels, definitely, but our custom I.O. unit has to arbitrate the extra priorities rather than the M2 drive's flash controller. And so the M2 drive needs a little extra speed to take care of issues arising from the different approach. That commercial drive also needs to physically fit inside of the bay we created in PlayStation 5 for M2 drives. Unlike internal hard drives, there's unfortunately no standard for the height of an M2 drive. And some M2 drives have giant heat sinks. In fact, some of them even have their own fans. Right now, we're getting M2 drive samples and benchmarking them in various ways. When games hit beta as they get ready for the PlayStation 5 launch at year end, we'll also be doing some compatibility tests. Stick to that launch. architecture Still. of particular M2 drives isn't too foreign for the games to handle. Once we've done that compatibility testing, we should be able to start letting you know which drives will physically fit and which drive samples have benchmarked appropriately high in our testing. It would be great if that happened by launch, but it's likely to be a, a bit past it. So please hold off on getting that M2 drive until you hear from us. Okay, back to our principles. Balancing evolution and revolution is the second of them. This was definitely a recurring theme with the GPU. We need new GPU features and capabilities. If, if we only have more performance, it's not really a new generation of console. <laughs> of course, many of these capabilities result in more performance. That's part of why a PlayStation 5 teraflop is more powerful than a PlayStation 4 teraflop. But we aren't just looking for the performance. We also need the ability to do something with the GPU that could not have been done before. And we need higher performance per watt. Every time we double the performance of some GPU component, we don't want to find out we've doubled the power consumed and the heat produced. But at the same time, we have to make sure the GPU can run PS4 games. And we have to ensure that the architecture is easy for the developers to adopt. Sorry about that fan noise. Now, backwards compatibility was handled <laughs> masterfully by AMD. They treated it as a key need throughout the design process. As our solution to adding new features without blindsiding developers, we made sure that if there were new significant features, it would be optional to use them. The GPU supports ray tracing, but you don't have to use ray tracing to make your game. The GPU supports primitive shaders, but you can release your first game on PlayStation 5 without making any use of them. Before I get into the capabilities of the GPU, I'd like to make clear two points that can be quite confusing. First, Two points. we have a custom AMD GPU based on their RDNA 2 technology. What does that mean? AMD is continuously improving and revising their tech. For RDNA 2, their goals were, roughly speaking, to reduce power consumption by re-architecting the GPU to put data close to where it's needed, to optimize the GPU for performance, and to add a new, more advanced feature set. But that feature set is malleable, which is to say that we have our own needs for PlayStation, and that can factor into what the AMD roadmap becomes. So collaboration is born. If we bring concepts to AMD that are felt to be widely useful, then they can be adopted into RDNA 2 and used broadly, including in PC GPUs. If the ideas are sufficiently specific to what we're trying to accomplish, like the GPU cache scrubbers I was talking about, then they end up being just for us. If you see a similar discrete GPU available as a PC card at roughly the same time as we release our console, that means our collaboration with AMD succeeded uh, in producing technology useful in both worlds. Semi-confused. It doesn't mean that we as Sony simply incorporated the PC card listen. into our console. This continuous improvement in AMD technology means it's dangerous to rely on teraflops as an absolute indicator of performance. Ah. And CU count should be avoided as you well. You see? In the case of CPUs, we all understand this. The PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 each have eight CPUs, but we never think that meant the capabilities and performance are equal. It's the same for CUs. For one thing, they've been getting much larger over time. The thing I've learned from this adding presentation is that not one piece of information the defines the power of the PlayStation fact, Yes, the You've made that clear, Mark Cerny. The PlayStation Cerny. 5 yeah. CU is 62% larger than the transistor count for a PlayStation 4 CU. Second, the PlayStation 5 GPU is backwards compatible with PlayStation 4. What does that mean? One way you can achieve backwards hmm. compatibility is to put the previous console's chipset in the new console, like we did with some PlayStation 3s. But that's, okay. of course, extremely expensive. A hmm. better way is to incorporate any differences in the previous console's logic into the new console's custom chips, meaning that 
even as the technology evolves, the logic and feature set that PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro titles rely on is still available in backwards compatibility mode. A lot of space down there. One advantage of this strategy is that... You got some more space for more logos down there, Cerny. In the console, Three, two, one, Cerny. Not as if a cost down will remove backwards compatibility Four. like it did on PlayStation 3. Achieving this unification of functionality took years of efforts by AMD, as any roadmap advancement creates a potential divergence in logic. Running PS4 and PS4 titles at boosted frequencies has also added complexity. The boost is truly massive this time around, and some game code just can't handle it. Testing has to be done on a title-by-title -title basis. Results are excellent, though. We recently took a look at the top 100 PlayStation 4 titles as ranked by Playtime, and we're expecting almost right all of to be playable at launch on PlayStation 5. Fortnite, it's gotta be up there. With Look regards to new features, as I said, our strategy was to try to break new ground, but at the same time not to require use of the new GPU capabilities. For more than a decade, GPUs have imposed a restriction on game engines. Software handles vertex processing, but for the most part, dedicated hardware is responsible for the triangles and other geometry that the vertices form. That means it's not possible to do even basic optimizations, such as aborting processing of a vertex if all geometry that uses it is off screen. PlayStation 5 has a, a new unit called the Geometry Engine, which brings handling of triangles and other primitives under full programmatic control. As a game developer, you're free to ignore Dope. its existence and use the PlayStation 5 GPU as if it were no more capable than the PS4 GPU, or you can use this new intelligence in various ways. Simple usage could be performance optimization, such as removing back-faced or off-screen vertices and triangles. More complex usage involves something called primitive shaders, which allow the game to synthesize geometry on the fly as it's being rendered. It's a brand new capability. Using primitive shaders on PlayStation 5 will allow for a, a broad variety of techniques, including smoothly varying level of detail, addition of procedural detail to close-up objects, and improvements to particle effects and other visual special effects. Another major new feature of our custom RDNA 2-based GPU oh, yeah. is ray tracing, using the same strategy this. as AMD's upcoming <laughs> PC GPUs. I understand The it. CUs contain a new specialized unit called the Intersection Engine, which can calculate the intersection of rays with boxes and triangles. To use the Intersection Engine, first you build what is called an acceleration structure. It's data in RAM that contains all of your geometry. There's a specific set of formats you can use. They're variations on the same BVH concept. Then, in your shader program, you use a new instruction that asks the intersection engine to check array against the BVH. While the intersection engine is processing the requested ray triangle or ray box intersections, the shaders are free to do other work. Having said that, the ray tracing instruction is pretty memory intensive, so it's a good mix with logic heavy code. There's of course no need to use ray tracing. PS4 graphics engines will run just fine on PlayStation 5, but it presents an opportunity for those interested. I'm thinking it'll take less than a million rays a second to have a big impact on audio. That should be enough for audio occlusion and some reverb calculations. With a bit more of the GPU invested in ray tracing, it should be possible to do some very nice global illumination. Having said that, Adding ray traced shadows and reflections to a traditional graphics engine could easily take hundreds of millions of rays a second, and full ray tracing could take billions. How far can we go? I'm starting to get quite bullish. I've already seen a PlayStation 5 title that's successfully using ray tracing based reflections in complex animated scenes with only modest costs. What Another is it? set of issues for the GPU <laughs> in size and what frequency. How big do we make the GPU? Yeah, not three. And what frequency do we run it at? This is a balancing act. The chip has a cost, and there's a cost for whatever it's we also use. To a hilarious thing to say in this presentation. I, just today, in just general, yesterday, I saw a PS5 game killing it. At killing it. Frequency. Let me show you why. Raise over here, Here's raise over there. <laughs> possible configurations for a GPU roughly of the level of the PlayStation 4 Pro. <laughs> this is a thought experiment. Don't take these configurations too seriously. If you just calculate teraflops, you get the same number. But actually, the performance is noticeably different because teraflops is defined as the computational capability of the vector ALU. That's just one part of the GPU. There are a lot of other units. And those other units all run faster when the GPU frequency is higher.
At 33% higher frequency, rasterization goes 33% faster. Processing the command buffer goes that much faster. The L2 and uh, other caches have that much higher bandwidth, and so on. About the only downside is that system memory is 33% further away in terms of cycles. But the large number of benefits more than counterbalance that. As a friend of mine says, a rising tide lifts all boats. Just also, it's easier to just fully use yeah. 36 Kojima? meters in parallel Mac. than it is to fill. Is that a just training reference? <laughs> when triangles are small, it's much harder to fill all those CUs with useful work. So there's a lot to be said for faster, assuming you can handle the resulting power and heat issues, which frankly, we haven't always done the best job at. Oh. Part of the reason for that is, historically, our process for setting yes. CPU and GPU frequencies. The axe is the bow. See, I'm sitting comfortably with the bow over there. You, your, your axe craziness. And pushing it. I know. You're pushing it, Huber. Blood's yeah. just s sitting pretty. Yeah, yeah I I just cruise control, Bloodworth. <laughs> when I play God of War on my PS4 Pro, I know the power consumption is high just by the fan noise. But power isn't simply about engine yes, quality. Yes, this is so good. It's yeah. about the minutia of what's being displayed and how. It's counterintuitive, but processing dense geometry typically consumes less power than processing simple geometry, which is, <laughs> I suspect, why Horizon's map screen, with its low triangle count, makes my PS4 Pro heat up so much. Mm. Our process on previous consoles has been to try to guess what the maximum power consumption during the entire console lifetime might be, which is to say, the worst case scene in the worst case game and prepare a cooling solution that we think will be quiet at that power level. If we get it right, fan noise is minimal. If we get it wrong, the console will be quite loud for the higher power games, and there's even a chance that it might overheat and shut down if we misestimate power too badly. PlayStation 5 is especially challenging wait. because the CPU supports 256-bit native instructions so wait, that consume how, how loud is it? These are great here and there, but presumably only minimally used. Or are they? If we plan for major 256-bit instruction usage, <laughs> He's we saying, we'll see. the CPU clock. You tell us. Yeah, I, I really need to see a lot of that thing is. <laughs> Post videos <laughs> on Twitter of your... PS5 so, making noise. After <laughs> much discussion, we decided to go with a very different direction on PlayStation 5. We built a GPU with 36 CUs. Mind you, our DNA 2 CUs are large. Each has 62% more transistors than the CUs we were using on PlayStation 4. So if we compare transistor counts, 36 RDNA2 CUs equates to roughly 58 PlayStation 4 CUs. It is a fairly sizable GPU. Then we went with a variable frequency strategy for PlayStation 5, which Boosting. is to say we continuously run the GPU and CPU in boost mode. We supply a generous amount of electrical power and then increase the frequency of GPU and CPU until they reach the capabilities of the system's cooling solution. It's a completely different paradigm. Rather than running at constant frequency and letting power vary based on the workload, we run at essentially constant power and let the frequency ba vary based on the workload. We then tackle the engineering challenge. I've mostly got that. Effective and high performance cooling solution designed for that specific power level. In some ways, it becomes a simpler problem because there are no more unknowns. There's no need to guess what power consumption the worst case game might have. As for the details of the cooling solution, we're saving them for our teardown. I think you'll be quite happy with what the engineering team came up with. Teardown? Okay. I think so, we'll just the end of the I guess, yeah, we're going to open that thing up. Tear it down, sir. Tear it down. The simplest approach would be to nice. look at the actual temperature of the silicon die and throttle awesome. the frequency on that basis. But that won't work. It fails to create a consistent PlayStation 5 experience. It wouldn't do to run a console slower simply because it was in a hot room. So rather than look at the actual temperature of the silicon die, we look at the activities that the GPU and CPU are performing and set the frequencies on that basis, which makes everything deterministic and repeatable. While we're at it, we also use AMD's smart shift huh. technology and send I AMD realize fans were based power from purely on temperature. <laughs> so it That's interesting. Out yep. A few more pixels. Thing gets going. The benefits of this, this strategy are quite large. Running a GPU at two gigahertz was looking like an unreachable target with the old fixed frequency strategy. 
With this new paradigm, we're, we're able to run way over that. In fact, we have to cap the GPU frequency at 2.23 gigahertz so that we can guarantee that the on-chip logic operates properly. 36 CUs at 2.23 gigahertz is 10.3 teraflops. And we expect the GPU to spend most of its time at Slightly or close less to than that frequency Xbox. and performance. Similarly, running the CPU at 3 gigahertz was causing headaches with the old strategy. But now we can run it as high as 3.5 gigahertz. In fact, it spends most of its time at that frequency. That doesn't mean all games will be running at 2.23 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz. When that worst case game arrives, it will run at a lower clock speed, but not too much lower. To reduce power by 10%, it only takes a couple of percent reduction in frequency. So I'd expect any down clocking to be pretty minor. All things considered, the change to a variable frequency approach will show significant gains for PlayStation gamers. The final of our three principles was about finding new dreams. It's important for us on the hardware team to find new ways to expand or deepen gaming. They didn't and finish that's that graphic. What led us to a focus. They had to cut straight audio. to that image there. As players, we experience oh, the game through the visuals, through audio, and through the feedback we receive from the controller, such as rumble or haptics. Personally, I feel a game is just dead without audio. Visuals are, of course, important, but the impact of audio is huge as well. At the same time, the audio team on a game project has to do a lot with a little. For example, on PlayStation 4, there's fierce competition for the Jaguar CPU cores. Audio typically ends up getting just a fraction of a core. That's not much of a computational resource, particularly when I know I gotta go the visuals run oh, 30 or 60 be, frames a second, but audio Jones. processing needs to happen at almost 200 times a second. So, it's been tough going making forward progress on audio with PlayStation 4, particularly when PlayStation 3 was such a beast when it came to audio. The SPUs in Cell were almost a perfect device for audio rendering. I Simple explain this to you when he comes back. could really take advantage of asynchronous DMA and frequently reached 100% utilization of the floating point unit. There's unfortunately nothing comparable on PlayStation 4. Probably the most dramatic progress in the PlayStation 4 generation has been go. with virtual reality. The PSVR hardware has its own audio unit. It supports about 50 pretty decent 3D sound sources. And this provided a hint as to where we could go with audio, as well as some valuable experience. Not to oversimplify, but here were our goals for audio on PlayStation 5. The first goal was great audio for everyone, not just VR users or soundbar owners or headphone users. That meant audio had to be part of the console. It couldn't be a peripheral. The second goal was to support hundreds of sound sources. We didn't want developers to have to pick and choose what sounds would get 3D effects and which wouldn't. We wanted every sound in the game to have dimensionality. Hmm. And finally, we wanted to really take on the challenges of presence and locality. Now, when we say presence, we mean the feeling that you're actually there. You've entered the matrix. It's not, of course, something we thought we could perfectly achieve. There it the is. Look, you did it. What? The Sony Matrix. Dude! And instead, Just in time. Lots in the movie. of 3D audio sources from what? radio to the ground. All sorts of locations around you. And at some point, your brain would take a leap and you'd begin to have this feeling. I don't even this see the PlayStation 5. The I just see blonde, brunette, redhead. Lady in a red this dress. This has the capacity to affect your appreciation of the game, just like music in a game does. The concept of locality is simpler. It's just your sense of where the audio is coming from. To the right of you, behind you, above you. This can immerse you further in the game, and it can also directly enhance the gameplay. To use dead space as an example, I know, old school, you're fighting enemies in fairly dark yeah, brutal, man. Locations. Jack, dead space? You're Back killing me day, here, man. Back in you played the game using the TV. Dead space before convert! You tell that there was one last enemy growling and hunting you down, but it was Necromorphs. difficult to tell where that enemy was. With headphones, you could tell that the enemy was somewhere on the right, which lets you deduce, if you couldn't see it, that it must be somewhere behind and to your right. But with 3D audio with good locality, the idea is you know the enemy is precisely there and you turn, and you take it out. 
D so, killed. Dying How words. Do you know where Grim. sound is coming from in the first place? <laughs> well, all those bumps and curves evolutionarily speaking. Based on what direction the sound is coming from, sound waves bounce around inside the ear, there's some constructive and destructive interference, and the result is a change in volume. The phase of the sound also shifts, depending on what path the sound wave took to reach the ear canal. These volume changes and phase shifts are different for each direction and also vary depending on the frequency of the sound. Head size and head shape also impact the sound in a similar fashion. Whoa. The way that the sound changes based on direction and frequency can How be encoded here? in a table called the Head Related Transfer Function, or HRTF. Here's part of one. The vertical axis is the frequency, the horizontal axis is the direction, front, back, left, right, and the color gives the degree of attenuation of the sound at that frequency. The HRTF is as unique to an individual as a fingerprint is. In fact, you're looking at mine right now. Yeah. Here's how Leaning we a little to the right there, Cerny. We've taken hundreds of people through this process. We put a microphone hmm. in the subject's left and right ear canals, and then sit the subject down in the middle of an array of 22 speakers. We then play an audio sweep from each speaker as we rotate the subject. Control in the course vibes. of 10 or 20 minutes, we're able to sample the HRTF Sherman. at over 1,000 locations. Using an HRTF when rendering audio creates unparalleled quality, but it's computationally expensive. The simplest way to use an HRTF is to process a sound source to make it appear as if it's coming from one of those thousand locations we sample. Unfortunately, the processing has to be done in frequency domain rather than time domain, so there's multiple fast Fourier transforms needed for every sound source for every audio tick. That's a lot of multiplies. This computational complexity was the determining factor for our strategy. It meant we had to bite the bullet and design and build a custom hardware unit for 3D audio. Collectively, we're referring to the hardware unit and the proprietary algorithms we run on it as Tempest 3D Audio Tech. The meaning of 3D audio and technology should be pretty obvious here. As for Tempest, I feel it really reflects our goals with audio. It suggests a certain intensity of experience and also hints at your presence within it. We're calling the hardware unit that we built the Tempest engine. It's based on AMD's GPU technology. We modified a compute unit in such a way as to make it very close to the SPUs in PlayStation 3. Remember when I said that they were ideal for audio? So the Tempest engine has no caches, just like an SPU. He set that up. All data access is via DMA, <laughs> just like an SPU. Our target was that it would have more power than a CPU, thanks to the parallelism that a GPU can achieve, and that it would be more efficient than our GPU, thanks to the SPU-like architecture. The goal being to make possible near 100% utilization of the CU's vector units. Where we ended up is a unit with roughly the same SIMD power and bandwidth as all eight Jaguar cores in the PlayStation 4 combined. If we were to use the same algorithms as PSVR, that's enough for something like 5,000 sound sources. But of course, we want to use more complex algorithms and we don't need anything like that number of sounds. It would have been Yet. wonderful if a simpler strategy, such as using Dolby Atmos peripherals, could have achieved our goals, but we wanted 3D audio for all, not just those with licensed sound bars or the like. Also, we wanted many hundreds of sound sources, not just the 32 that Atmos supports. And finally, we wanted to be able to throw an overwhelming yeah, amount of processing at power. Yeah, suck at Atmos. And it wasn't clear what any peripheral might have inside of it. In fact, with the Tempest engine, we've even got enough power that we can allocate some to the games, to the extent that games want to make use of convolution reverb and other algorithms that are either computationally expensive or need high bandwidth. But the primary purpose of the Tempest engine remains 3D audio. Now, 3D audio is a major academic research topic. It's safe to say that no one in the world has all of the answers. And the set of algorithms that has to be invented, tuned, or implemented to realize our vision for 3D audio is immense. For example, use of HRTFs in games is quite complex. Before, I talked about making a sound source appear as if it's coming uh, from one of those thousand HRTF sample locations. But for high quality 3D game audio, we have to handle other possibilities. The sound source might not be at one of the thousand HRTF sample locations, so we have to blend the HRTF data from the closest locations that we have sampled. 
the sound source might be moving, which needs very special handling as that blend keeps changing and that can cause phase artifacts in the resulting audio. Or the sound source might have a size to it, meaning it should feel as if it's coming from an area rather than a single point. There's also whole categories of approaches to be handled. 3D audio can be implemented using individual processing of 3D sound sources. But alternatively, ambisonics can be used for 3D audio. Ambisonics well, it's like, like they're not going to show the box, are they? <laughs> it's like, I don't think so. Not and finally, today. there's audio devices. The player Just might be using headphones or TV speakers or have a higher end surround sound set up with six or more speakers, all of which need different approaches. That's a lot of variations. It's nice to have the computational resources of the Tempest engine, but it's clear that achieving our ultimate goals with 3D audio is going to be a multi-year step-by-step process. Having said that, headphone audio implementation is largely complete at this time. Uh, it was a natural place for us to start. With headphones, we control exactly what each ear hears, and therefore the algorithmic development and implementation are more straightforward. For TV speakers and stereo speakers, we're in the process of implementing virtual surround sound. The idea being that if you're sitting in a sweet spot in front of the TV, then the sound can be made to feel as if it's coming from any direction, even behind you. Virtual surround sound has a lot in common with 3D audio on headphones, but it's more complex because the left ear can hear the right speaker and vice versa. We have a basic implementation of virtual surround sound up and running. We're now looking at increasing the size of that sweet spot, which is to say making the area you need to be in to feel the 3D effect larger. And we're also working to boost the sense of locality. Headphone audio is the current gold standard for 3D audio on PlayStation 5, but we're going to see what we can do to bring virtual surround sound to a similar level, after which we'll start in on setups with more speakers, such as six-channel surround sound. It's now to the point where some of the PlayStation nice. 5 games in development are extensively using these systems. One of the game demos allows you to toggle between conventional PlayStation 4-style stereo audio and our new 3D audio. I listened with just an ordinary pair of over-the-ear headphones, and wow, I could feel a difference. 3D audio has that dimensional feel to it. Conventional stereo audio feels smashed flat by comparison. The improvement is obvious. It's the same game so, he's talking about before. Killing it. Killing, killing it. Matrix. Does my wow. brain believe I'm really there? Like I was talking about earlier when I explained... Yo, know, Matrix? PS5 launch game? Well, wow. the answer is no. But you've probably caught on to what's missing <laughs> here, namely whose HRTF was being used. It wasn't mine. It's a very it personal thing for him to share today, i got to be honest. The audio team analyzed the hundreds <laughs> that they measured and chose the one they felt was the closest fit to the total game-playing audience. This shows a, a piece of the default HRTF on the left and my HRTF on the right. You can see that the general features are much the same, but the details are quite different. With the default HRTF, as I said, the 3D audio sounds pretty great. When I use my HRTF, though, the audio reaches a, a higher level of realism, which is to say that when using headphones and my HRTF, I occasionally get fooled and even think a sound is coming from the real world when it's actually coming from the game. <laughs> a corollary to this is that there are a few people whose HRTFs are sufficiently far from the default HRTF, that's the red dot here, that they can toggle between PS4 style and PS5 style audio and not sense much difference. I've had a few people describe the PlayStation 5's 3D audio as sounding like a bit better stereo audio. Presumably, they're the ones at the very edges of this diagram. Which means what HRTF you're using is key. I'd like everyone to be able to experience what I'm experiencing, but obviously it's not possible to measure the HRTF of every PlayStation user. That means HRTF selection and synthesis are going to be big topics going forward as the Tempest technology matures. At PlayStation 5 launch, we'll be offering a choice of five HRTFs. There's a, a simple test where you pick the one that gives you the best locality. Whoa, that's, that's just pretty awesome, step, dude. Though. This is an that's really cool research topic. I really like this. Maybe you'll be sending us a photo of your ear. I gotta know what all the allies the HRTFs are. Yeah, the that's gonna be key. HRTF in our library. Maybe you'll be sending us a video of your ears and your head, and we'll make a 3D <laughs> model of them and synthesize what? the HRTF. 
Maybe you'll play an audio game to tune your HRTF. We'll be subtly changing it as you play and home in on the HRTF that gives you the highest score, meaning that it matches you the best. It's already finished. This is a, a journey we'll all be taking together over the next few years. Ultimately, we're committing to enabling everyone to experience that next level of realism. Can I draw it Hopefully, for you? I've been able to illustrate <laughs> some a bit about our design here, and kinda... decision making process today and why PlayStation 5 has the feature set that it does. Now comes the fun part. We get to see how the development community takes advantage of that feature set. I'm hoping for the completely unexpected. Will it come from audio, ray tracing, the capabilities of the SSD, or something else? I guess we'll find out soon enough. Thank you for your time today. There it is. All right. Whoa, didn't they see it. We wrapped that up pretty quick. That's shocking <laughs> that we didn't see it. Hmm. Yeah. They just went from a solid, like, eight or nine. Oh, dude, that was weird. <laughs> I was, I was really hyped on everything until it just from? abruptly ended. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, where's the teardown? Where's the... Yeah, yeah you said it was going to tear down. Where's the teardown? You said it was going to tear down today. Where's the teardown? Loved it, though. Overall, aside from not showing it, that was that's unfortunate. Um, I really thought they, they were well, going to show I think, it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the important thing to think about right now is not necessarily like what was the point of that presentation because that was you know people lots of people are mentioning in chat apologies to everybody that was expressing frustration you know because it's like you need to realize first of all not only that this is going to be a gdc pre presentation Loved it. second of all uh based on the you know saying that cerny was going to be there you're like okay you know and they set Deep a precedence time. for him you know he really you know made his presence known uh in the development of the playstation 4 that like i'm i am taking this over get used to me because i am going to be you know working with this team supervising all this stuff um and he said like spending a lot of my time during the ps4 lifetime traveling to all these other developers continually checking in with them like what yeah. do you need you know not only for you know uh playstation 5 but ps4 pro when they were developing that and three um, the moment this presentation starts, <laughs> you see like the four shadows. Yeah. I like the Phil Harrison vibes yeah. going on with the guy on the left. But, uh, uh, the moment that starts out, hi everybody, how you doing? You know, just hey. like, I like how they needed a guy to introduce Cerny, because couldn't start with Cerny. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, That Mark, was a weird intro. Cerny! I, I feel like the first words were like, it wasn't even hello, it was... Unfortunately, or isn't that <laughs> yeah. the first thing they said? And that actually, I do want to point to that is I was surprised Cerny today mentioned weird. like it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Like he did kind of talk about some of the 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 stuff they're still working on, some yeah. of the stuff that was he that he admitted they haven't done really well in the past. Like I think he like came just shy of basically saying that some games just straight up break the fan on your PS4 Pro. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Because you have, you've got, you know, guys that are like diehard PlayStation fans like Greg Miller that are just like, the hell is going on with my system right now? And it's crazy because sometimes I'll see people posting videos where they're like, I'm playing some game and it's like, weird, I'm playing the same game on my PlayStation 4 Pro and it's not, yeah. it does that, but not for that game, for something else. Yeah. Um, and so I, I thought actually one of the, the interesting takeaways was the the variability in terms of like judging performance that it's not just like oh the game is asking this much from the cpu the game is generating this much heat so therefore the fan's going to hit this or we're going to know it's being stressed out to this level the fact that it's like we're determining that before we even get to that yeah. point like we know um you know that this is that this game is like a contender for for shaking things up totally uh explaining that in the absolute worst possible way but i think it is worth talking about the fact that we haven't seen this console because we have not only seen the uh, you know the Xbox Series X have deconstructed it now. We've yeah. seen the inside of it. All We've of seen it. you know all of the little components. We've seen it built, um, and so it's which a, is technically stronger now. And it's a weird yeah. There Confirmed. were there were strange like gaps in the presentation where like they specifically made the graphic that had like the PS3 architecture like next underneath the PS4, and then they bring in the PS5, and it's like, why use the thing with the space yeah. down yeah. below to, to, to specifically show the consoles when they showed PS1, PS2, PS3, and then PS4, and you can see all of the models, and then there's like, I did a PS5 logo for the yeah. PS5. It's like, why? You don't even need to show the hardware when you're talking about those old consoles, because I thought they were going to fill that in after the fact. Totally. So... Yeah, the backwards compatibility, you know. He mentioned it like six times. Yeah, because Xbox has been crushing that for years. 
and PS4 had like no backwards compatibility whatsoever. Yeah. Aside from like PS Now Worker. Right. You know. So I think like. I think it's like built in backwards compatibility. Like it's cool. Like out of the box, what discs can you put in and you're done? It's cool that PS5 has backwards compatibility with four, but it's we're still in this place where it's like, well, even now, like I have a PS4 and I want to play like my PS2 and PS3 games. We're yeah. still in kind of the same spot as we were with PS4. So I really think it's like not a win or a loss. It's like PS5 well, having even, backwards compatibility with four is kind of a moot point. I don't know. Well, one thing that I think is is smart. And, and cool, it makes sense kind of for what we're expecting out of this next gen that Microsoft has talked about is uh, backwards compatibility with the controller. That they're like, you can use you know your, your standard, if you have an Elite, you can use that on the Xbox Series X. You can go backwards mm -hmm. if there's something that you want to play on the Xbox One for some reason. Like, you don't have to hunt around for the controller or, like, put a sticker on it if you can't yeah. tell the difference between the two controllers. We haven't seen this the DualShock 5 yet, you know? So, like, that's something he could have mentioned without showing the DualShock 5, you could have mentioned, like, you know, kind of... Uh, it's interesting, like, to talk so much about sound, to talk so much about um, compression, and not mention the, the, the device we're going to be using yeah. to control all of these games. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You, you know, he's, he's talking about our heads and our ears. What about our hands, bro? I know. What about my fingers, Cerny? Jones, I'm already prepared for the the wars of teraflops. I already see a little <laughs> bit in chat. And it's just like, it's such the a weird wars. number. It's like, not the end-all be-all of well, yeah. games or, or what, what do you make of that? Like, if PS5 is quote-unquote weaker, or yeah. the weaker system, is that going to dictate... Uh, you know the the console wars of next gen, like or... the dialogue for sure. It's just a, you just want to have that easy number again. It's like they're both gonna have SSDs. So like, okay, fine. Yeah. You know, like you, you you want that directly comparable thing. Um, I I mean I am always like I'm not I'm not focused on tech because I know I only got so many time to play games anyway. Like I'm. Uh, uh, honestly, really, when it comes to games, I think uh, Halo Infinite's like the thing I'm most curious about, just like specifically what, what they're going to be doing with that franchise. I think yeah. that's like, you know, I think that's almost actually kind of in line with like a Smash Brothers Ultimate or like Mario Odyssey or Breath of the Wild and that like Nintendo being like, let's make a new game in this franchise that pleases everybody. <laughs> yeah. So I think like Infinite's going to, uh, Infinite just feels like something that's going to, you know, uh, hopefully just try to, you know, bring in all new people, satisfy multiplayer fans, have a cool new story. You know, you Fortnite fan? Yeah, we got a little of that in there, too. Um, but I think what's most interesting about what Cerny did today was, c compared to the dialogue that Microsoft has been having, is, like, Microsoft is really trying to push mostly positive information. And the thing that I love about Cerny, that I have, like, no regrets whatsoever showing up today and yeah. watching this and, like, really so focusing on what he's talking about. Shout out to Cerny. Was kind of this, like... Going back to the beginning, it's like like go back in time to like two years, two or three years after the PlayStation Four came out, and think about like where we were then, not where we are now. And like yeah, 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 we've been doing a lot of work, but we built this thing. Look at this thing that we built. You know, it's like here's where our heads were at in, in determining like what. Obviously, it's like we listened to the developers. It's like yeah, really, you know, <laughs> it's like you <laughs> did. did? Yeah. Let me just say, this, you know, for for this generation, we thought screw the developers. Yeah. You know, we thought hey, Corey you know, Barlog was asking for something, <laughs> yeah. and you know what? We, we wanted, said no. We wanted to go back, you know, to the golden era of the cell process of the PlayStation Three. We wanted to make it difficult for them. We wanted to see what kind of hurdles can Sony Santa Monica jump through. You know, how, how difficult will it be for Media Molecule to translate dreams to the PlayStation Five? Um, <laughs> But really him kind of talking about, like, the culture at the at, at Sony and what, what, what challenges that they had. Uh, and even if there were, like, you know, things were just flying, like, way over my head. It's like, okay, this is really interesting. Before, you know, you unveil it, it's just, like, this conversation needed to happen. <laughs> if not last month or the month before that in 2019. Like, we're at the stage now where, like, if you want to make me understand what Sony's doing... Okay, if you want to make me understand technically what the system's going to be capable of, and if you really crunch the numbers, things that they are focusing on that are different than Microsoft. If you want to get me excited for this piece of hardware, you got to show it. Not there. You, you got to like, show I'm it. Not, yeah. Uh, At this point, you had to show it. Yeah. I'm really shocked they didn't show it. I'm blown away they didn't show it. I was like up here in the nine range because, like, to convey all of this tech jargon. 
you know, not the most interesting information, and it's just a lot of numbers that like were yeah. over my head. They made it interesting, you know. Cerny's presentation was awesome, rock solid. They hit all the points as like a fan of games. I wanted to know about. I wanted to know yeah. specs. I wanted to know fan noise. I wanted to know load times. They hit all those beats in like a pretty digestible way. But it was all kind of building up to the grand reveal, yeah. and then he's like, alright, peace out. <laughs> well, that's, so, well, that's interesting to think about fan noise. Mm. Again, going back to, you know, mm. even this, like, like, slight shades of negativity, where he's like, this is hard. Yeah. This is easy to screw up. It's like, whoa. <laughs> that's an interesting thing to say. <laughs> when you're just slowly <laughs> rolling out the red carpet for this console. It's like, if we miss that mark, you know, we've, you know, we're either throttling performance or we're, you know... We're, uh, we're turning this thing into a jet engine. It's like, and did, I'm assuming you didn't do that. Yeah, like, know? what is it? And it was interesting, <laughs> you know, for him to talk about things like Tempest that are like, we're still kind of working on this. You know, this is not only something that obviously, yeah. you know, I, I think it's safe money to assume that we're going to get a PlayStation 5 Pro or that they're going to, you know, they're not talking about it in the way that Xbox is. Xbox is completely leaning into that, where they're like, oh, you're going to get 10 of these things. Yeah. You know, the Series X, Series whatever, every letter of the alphabet we're pumping yeah. out. Um, but it was it was interesting that it was kind of a snapshot of, uh, and and on and that is honestly comforting for me as a consumer to know that like because we're wondering like is it going to be a PS6 where we're we still doing this and like it it feels like that team is is chugging along you know it seems like yeah. that team is really like that locomotive has left the station and they're like we are you know completely thinking about the future constantly Tempest is something that we are invested in for the long term yeah. no matter what you know box we put that in yeah but. Which is awesome, like, I was fortunate enough in college to live with my bro who had, like, a gnarly surround sound system. Mm -hmm. But now I live in a small apartment, right. so I have, like, little dinky stereo things, so I just use headphones. So that whole thing was, like, really encouraging to me because I use headphones the most. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed that entire part, even though I didn't understand most of it. Right. Uh, you know, basically him just saying... Headphone audio. I was doing like priority. bird's eye really uh, cool. uh, measurements of like where my TV is from where I sit when they had that overhead diagram. And I'm like, yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's <laughs> where my head's at. Okay, cool, cool. Well, yeah, what was it? The right HTFs or whatever? HRTF. HRTF. Yeah, uh, man. That's going to be the key. We got to yeah, do a live we gotta stream. We got to guess all of our HRTFs. I wonder, no, no, no. We got to do a live stream where we just put up the, we just put it up and people have guess. to guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's Don's. I'm getting that sound. Oh, it's Bloods! Okay, okay, okay. Okay. We're showing up. Well, that's Ian's, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> Ian's just all red. Whoa, Ian! It's like, I've been telling you this whole time. Um, but again, yeah, they, again, that just seems um, interesting that that was like the only pictures that we saw behind the scenes. It was like the only look into their studio, you know? Yeah. Like, we didn't even see, because if they're scared... I don't know what the mindset is, like, not showing the console. Like, they're scared to really show, like, all of the pieces put together. You can at least show me, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, they have... Blood Earth was saying these, for pre-orders, they'll show it. They got these, uh, sure, of course. But, like, they have these, you know, this diagram. We got these little boxes being filled in to show, like, where all this stuff is passing through. And it's like, can't you just show, like, a piece of metal and show me it working that way? Like, you gotta be, you know, so discreet about it. Um... Because when is that opportunity, you know? It's like, yeah. they're not going to E3. Presumably I guess. We're, we're going to have a giant state of play, but those are more game-focused. Positive, positive spin. Sure. You get all this stuff. I don't want to say out of the way, and I don't want to say boring. I, I would say uh, academic and informational, right? Just right, right. all of this. GDC. Numbers yeah. and tech, right? You get out of the way. Next time, coming months, then you do, you know, the white cloth. Here it is. And here's some games. You just blow out the box and the games. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, specs or tech or any of that. It's just all killer, no filler. Here it is, games, boom! It's just the mental connection. <laughs> it's like, yeah. games and box don't, you know, presentation <laughs> yeah. that doesn't, you know. Sure, sure. It's I like, know, now would have been the perfect Here's time. what Horizon Zero Dawn looks yeah. like. Cool. And yeah. you'll be plugging in your controller into this thing. Like, yeah. All right, I don't, <laughs> you know, like, True. whereas after True. the presentation he just made, it's like, here's how all that stuff comes yes. together. Yeah, it would here's have been how, the icing on the cake, for sure. You know, it's interesting to see that fan, just this gigantic fan. Like, oh, and then you can see the, the vertical, you know, Xbox Series X. You can see this fan just, boom, you know, yeah. like these gigantic holes on the top of that thing. And just all this air, like, flying through it. Um, and so... When he talks about, you know, cooling, it's like, and then now the slam dunk on the end of that presentation yeah. is to show us, like, how that actually works <laughs> with how that system's, you know, uh, how that system's built. Sure. But, um, yeah. 
It's tough because I'm not like, uh, you know, it's tough also to communicate to an audience because I know there's a lot of people that are, you know, potentially on that fence. Because uh, I know I was 360 two gens ago, and then I've mostly been PS4 this gen, and so it's just like, I don't know where I'm going to wind up. Like, I started, like, the Xbox One was the first console that I bought, and then I just kind of leaned more generally into, you know, into PS4. I think when you kind of hit, you know, when it comes to multi-platform stuff, when you kind of hit the ground running with one console, um, you kind of stick to that for a while. And it was really interesting, he, he spoke to this, but it was interesting in the Xbox presentations how they showed, like, five games running at the same time. At least, yeah. like, the save states, you know, yep. where he's just yep. like, I can just bounce between mm -hmm. all of those things. Yeah. Which seems a little silly if you're just like, it seems like you're changing channels on TV. But if I'm queuing for stuff, exactly. If for there's something, games, if a game just launched and I'm I, waiting, like like when when Temtem first came out, yeah, we were just like, oh man, we're gonna be in the queue for like two hours. It's like, okay, I want to keep this up, and yeah. then I want to jump into another game at the same time. Like, yeah, that seems more directly to you know speaking to a consumer. And Absolutely. again, it seems more because I don't like. I think it is time to show stuff off in later presentations, and I think this was the time to get all the talking out of the way. Yeah. And so I wonder, I think there still is a lot more talking to do, and it's just weird, yeah, that that wasn't done today. Um, I wonder if their plans changed, obviously, because of uh, Corona, obviously, and, you know, That's the other thing that's worth saying, is that it doesn't And what seem... Microsoft has been doing, I mean, they just keep right. info, 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 info. I wonder... Yeah. If Sony was just like, all right, we got to do it today. Yeah. Or like, in the, in a, we got to do it. So I wonder... Well, I think they, I think they had this locked like, in for GDC. It's okay. just... Uh, um, but that's another interesting point, is that there doesn't seem to be any language from either teams about any potential slowdowns with factory shutdowns mm -hmm. or manufacturing or anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe... I mean, that's something they could potentially bump at the last minute, because it would suck to miss that Q4 window. But if they have to, it's like, we can just announce yeah. that at the same time if you're, you know... New your your pre-order still stands. Pre-order, new date. You just get it later. Yeah. Um, I appreciate it right off the top that he's like, hi, everybody. There'll be time to talk about games. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah! Yep. He um, Professional. Best in the biz. Tempered our expectations yeah. right out of the gate. No Batman. Jack 2 and uh, Dead Space. <laughs> yes! Great callbacks. Dead Space. Hell yeah, Dead You're Space. You're talking about hallways and enemies coming at you. It's like... Doom 2016? No. Nope. Call of Duty? Dead Space, baby. Dead Space. <laughs> First game I ever played in the Jones. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if there are like some people on the team. He's like, he's like, cool. He's like, how about uh, let's get a Dead Space screenshot? Can you put that together? I'm like, De Dead Space, certainly. Really? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? I don't know if that, like, yeah, you might get people's minds or something. It's just like Dead Space. It's like, well, okay, sure. Uh, uh, you know. Awesome. Dude, Cerny it. just single-handedly saved that franchise. <laughs> I loved it. Brought that franchise back from the dead. I would have loved it if, Thank like, you, Cerny. if like short, high-collared middle guy shadow, like just <laughs> <laughs> Let's show it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Turns to the shadow and is like, Dead Space, am I right? Yeah, EA right now is just like shit. <laughs> what are you doing to us, man? <laughs> dead Space is trending. It is. So EXX, good. wake up! What the hell? So good. What happened? Dead Space Remaster <laughs> Final. Ah, oh, what? Damn it! <laughs> See, but that's what I mean about the backwards compatibility thing, Jones. <laughs> right? The 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 loving, beautiful thing of of putting an older game in a new machine and having it run easily, run better, and now here we are. Dead Space Three is a PS3 game. Right. PS5 still has not solved the problem. Yeah. I cannot, still cannot play my old PS3 game on that newer system. You know, real big shout out to Microsoft, dude, that all the backwards compatibility is just... I feel, like I, it, guess... I feel like they're so far ahead of PlayStation in that particular category. Yeah. PS, PlayStation has a lot of ground to cover. And it's interesting you're talking about Xbox trickling out all of this information because I yeah. feel like there's still more to learn about Xbox where it's like, with Sony, it's like, I, you know, I'm curious... Uh, Honestly, more curious if they're going to tweak, do wacky things with the DualShock, because I love that controller so much, as opposed to, like, I really don't care that that... It's weird that they haven't shown it, but, like, I don't, like, honestly care what the system looks like, you know? It can, like, it could be any one of the weird things that we came up with. But, like, yeah, yeah I don't play it. It's, there's yeah. no, like, form factor for the PlayStation 5 that'll turn me off from the system. But, yeah. like, uh, I do feel like they've waited so long to even get this information out that I have to wonder, like, was that... I think that's it. Like, I don't know if we're going to get any more, like, deep... Call it, like, the deep dive. Yeah, it's like, I mean... Are you going to have multiple deep dive? We're going to dive deeper? I don't really know what... dive? Yeah, I don't know what else they could they could say, right? Um, 
just in terms of like yeah the actual like the raw tech behind yeah. it yeah um so again when you show off like the the actual system like is there going to be any talk leading up to that this is what you're looking at look at the back of it and here's what's going on yeah um where xbox went the opposite way where they showed the system and where we looked at the back of it and we're like wait whoa what's that thing and yeah. then later they're like that's you know an additional uh, drive yeah, yeah pop yeah. that in totally um thank you for joining us, for, yeah. for joining me. He talked so much about stuff he was going to do at the end. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. I know, I know. Boom, done. Yeah. Not even a recap, you know, yeah. not even like, you know, just... I know, when he said later, I didn't know it was like later. Yeah. I thought it was later, like today later. Yeah. Yeah. Not even like a logo at the end. Yeah. Not even a wave. He didn't even walk off. It was <laughs> such a hard <laughs> cut, man. It was man. the Ben Moore hard cut from like, last whoa. night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. You can play the RE3 demo right now, Huber. It's well, like a New Zealand account or something. We're okay, gonna, right, right, right. It, it comes out tomorrow here officially, and uh, I'll be here to shoot the podcast. And then uh, some other allies may or may not be joining me uh, for that. Right. If it wasn't for, for COVID, you'd be on a plane to New Zealand right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brandon right. Jones, Michael Huber. Yeah. Uh, thank you so be much safe for joining out there, us. Everyone. For the, yeah, exactly. Time to go wash our hands. Um, we, uh, what else? We had any streams going on today? Anything more happening? I don't think anything uh, today. Anything I'm shooting a fun thing with uh, Bloodworth that we can't talk about later today. Nice. Uh, that wow. will be coming up. Uh, oh, that we're going to be doing. Up. Bloodworth's going to be coming in and we're going to do it in the studio. We're going to be doing it uh, maybe just audio now. Uh, I don't know. We might just like be like Skyping at each other or something. But um, got some more fun, some more fun stuff coming up, and we got uh, lots of reviews in progress. And uh, yeah, a lot of reviews in progress. Clearly, more coming stuff up. to learn about the PlayStation Five that we did not find out today. No, no. But uh, be the show. I had a out. I, I honestly did. I'm I'm really glad I got up for this. I had a blast watching it. Had a blast watching it with you. Had a yeah. super fun time watching it with everybody uh, in chat. Thank you so much. Be kind to your mods. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for all your subs and resubs. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, we are Easy Honest. We'll be live again later. Thanks for watching, everybody. Love you, everyone. Can't wait to share my HRTF. <laughs>